So I'd like to start by introducing our first plenary speaker, and that is Prof Professor Claire Scott. Um, and Claire is a clinician scientist and chair of gynaecological cancer at the University of Melbourne, and she's joint division head of clinical translation at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Parkville. And Claire is a consultant medical oncologist at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, Royal Women's and Royal Melbourne Hospital. And her expertise is in gynaecological cancers, including clinical cancer genetics and coordinating care for patients with rare cancers. But she's done a huge body of work already and she's got further great highlights to come, um, and initiated the National uh, We High Stafford Fox Rare Cancer Program to study many rare cancers, which are poorly researched, and the Australian Rare Cancer Portal, which enables streamlining of expert rare cancer care and research for individuals throughout Australia. And that sort of initiative is so important in a relatively small population like Australia. She's received major awards, including the Cancer Australia Jeannie Ferris Recognition Award in Gynaecological Cancer and the uh, Moga Nervatus Oncology Cancer Achievement Award, which sounds more international. Is that right? That was national. That was national. So I think it'll be really exciting uh, to hear Claire today uh, as she tells us about her story. Claire. I think I don't have to be attached to the lectern. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying it's such a, an incredible honour to be asked to give this plenary. And not only reading the biographies in today's um, uh, program, but also looking online at people who've spoken in this type of setting before. Uh, they're really a remarkable group of individuals. So I hope that I can just lend my flavour to this and uh, give you some of those other things to think about that Ingrid was talking about. So I thought I would just start with a little bit of um, a staged process through my career, but uh, then move on to discuss more of the science, which is, and how decisions are made, because I think that's what's really important. So here you've got some major decision points along the way. Uh, you know, I completed medicine and then did my training and knew very early on that I wanted to do oncology. And um, did one year of oncology and then had this great plan that I was going to you know, finish my training and I wanted to go and work in this particular person's lab, Professor Glenn Begley. And so I went to see him and I thought that was really good because it was you know, a couple of years away and I was getting ready in advance. And he said, well, that's all very well, Claire, but I've got three students finishing this year and I'm going to fill all those spaces next year. So you can come next year, but you can't come the year after. So, you know, what you have to do, you just have to change your plan. And I'll talk a bit about opportunities um, further on. So I did do my PhD intercalated between my advanced training, which financially is a really bad thing to do, but it was really good from the perspective of having exposure. And all the way through that PhD, I had clinical exposure. In, in fact, that extended into genetics at a time when we didn't have training for cancer genetics. So it meant I was able to do something. It was a bit unusual because I had more flexibility with my time. So by the end of my um, final year, I had my second baby, that's James. I had my first, handed in my thesis at 36 weeks. I walked along with it on my tummy. That was for Will. So you'll see James and Will at the end again. But we went, I did my first postdoc. I did three postdocs. So this means that I'm one of the clinician scientists who's truly lab trained. It doesn't have to take nine to 10 years and it's not meant to. And I think things have improved now so that it, it wouldn't. But I did a short postdoc with Andrea Strasser for two years, who's just a legend in cell death at WEHI. And then I went to Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which I'll talk more about in a moment. And I always say, I only went for two years because I took my husband. Now, I was lucky I could drag him with me, but I couldn't actually stay for that sort of three, four, five year postdoc till I had all my papers. So I had one excellent paper and another paper that was coming, and we came back. And I was fortunate enough to go into Suzanne Corey's lab. Um, I didn't realize I was meant to actually be working on her research, and indeed I never did. Um, that was a slight misunderstanding. So I did my own research all the way through that um, quite extensive postdoc. But it did take a long while um, until I actually became a lab head. 
And so from my perspective, 2010, I was a full-time lab head at WeHi and had had an appointment at Royal Melbourne since 2006, and that was as a medical oncologist. And then eventually I added a session as a cancer geneticist as well. So the, um, David Botel, who's one of my sort of the gurus in my field, always says it takes about seven years to get your first really good paper and then they all just keep coming. And that's really what my um, background reflects. So um, there you can start to see um, additional sort of awards, but it takes that really, you know, sort of seven years. Um, there's also a 10,000 hour rule that I'm going to introduce, introduce you to in a moment. And I think I just wanted to display on this, it's a long time, but it's a great time because you're never not doing what you want to do. It's all relevant. You learn a lot and you're able to shape and make choices and do the work you want to do. So I just wanted to actually point out down the bottom, Duncan McPherson and his daughter, Tess. So Duncan is one of the most amazing ovarian cancer advocates. I'm going to talk about consumer, consumers all the way through my talk, just touching on their influence, certainly in my life and um, the lives of others. Um, Duncan, I heard speak, I was speaking directly after him, actually in the Weehai um, Auditorium, and he walked up onto the stage and he clunked down a handbag and he said, I'm really happy I can bring my wife's handbag today, but unfortunately I couldn't bring her with me. And I just never got over uh, walking out of that hospital room and taking her handbag with me. So the power of that story is just telling you, giving you examples for how powerful consumers can be. Um, but I'm going to talk about other people on the way through, so I'll leave it at that for now. So you need to have one really strong message that drives your career. It can change as you go, and this is a very broad one. I knew I wanted to be involved in cancer research right from actually the end of my first year. I forgot to say, I went down to the Lawn Cancer Conference, so it was at the end of my first year of training, and I was absolutely hooked. So that's also why I knew I wanted to be a scientist. So what is your big question? What's the biggest question you could possibly address, even if you don't think you have any chance of getting there, but what is the important question that you think is worth spending your life addressing? So I have taken a new approach to prevention. I'll talk about that at the end of the talk, and we're only just starting, but I believe we'll make an impact. Um, we cannot treat our way out of the cancer burden. Everyone understands that. Classic prevention is primary prevention, but prevention of metastasis is another way it could be considered. Um, just a, a word or two about this. So the uh, you know, incidence of cancer is rising, and even though we've got reducing death rates for a number of reasons, because the burden is rising, the number of total deaths is increasing. And so if we can't handle drugs, expensive drugs for everyone now, how are we going to be able to do that in the future? And how are we going to be able to do that in countries that are not as fortunate as Australia? So what is your big question? So here we are, Royal Melbourne, Walter Eliza Hall Institute. A couple of highlights along the way. So Glenn Begley up there was my PhD supervisor. He went off to Amgen, but before doing that, um, he had been involved and really pivotal in GCSF. So you can see the three tenors. I hope you're young enough to know who I'm talking about or old enough. Um, so Jose Carreras had lymphoma and he received his transplant at the Fred Hutch in Seattle, but he was, um, very grateful for receiving GCSF. And every time the three tenors come to see in Australia, they always uh, give tickets to a variety of people. And Glenn gave me his ticket. I'm like, I'm an opera buff, and, or at least tragic is the best way of putting it. And uh, that was just so extraordinary to sit in the MCG in the third front row. So that's just an example. You can get extraordinary, and I've got some more coming up, um, extraordinary experiences as a clinician scientist. So this is Cold Spring Harbour Lab where I did my postdoc and uh, we lived at the daycare just around the corner from Jim Watson's DNA Helix. So again, um, Inspiring Science was edited by Joseph Sambrook who was director of Peter Mack for many years, but he was also at Cold Spring Harbour for many years. So he's a great English but ANU PhD Australian scientist who um, wrote this amazing book if you can find it. I think it's in most of the Melbourne Uni bookshops. Um, and it just really talks about the way people impact on what we know, what we um, then use as tools, and how we make further discoveries. So there you go, lovely snow. I used to ride my bike 
to, from the daycare to the lab every day. It wasn't far, but the weather sure did change. So this is just another very brief example. So the Laurie Strauss Leukemia Foundation was one that I was awarded. And um, that family group who had set that up for their daughter had a concert fundraiser every year in Carnegie Hall. And somehow or other, the Kissingers were involved. So my husband and I had spent the day tramping around New York and went to this concert and realized we were being seated with the Kissingers in their box watching this and weren't appropriately dressed, but never mind. What was amazing was Liza Minnelli was going to sing New York, New York, but she wasn't actually good enough to do it. And John Kander and Fred Ebb, who wrote it, realized, and they went up to the stage and she sat down on the edge of the stage and they sang New York, New York together in New York. And I, again, I think that's just an example of how extraordinary life is and you have unforgettable experiences. But think what those three people brought together when they did that. And so, you know, music's a big thing for me and I think you've got to have something else other than work and so that's just an example. This is an example of how I, I wasn't in the right place at the right time. I was a Leukemia Lymphoma Society fellow and we had a show in uh, like a conference in Denver and we got driven in to the Mile High Stadium because all the chapters of LLS uh, compete to see who can provide the most memorable dinner. What we didn't realise, or I didn't realise, was that we were going down to touch the hallowed turf, which no one ever gets to touch because it costs at least $800 a ticket to go to the football. So that was pretty funny, and that was 20 years ago. So this was the daycare. And I went there for my um, postdoc because the year I was applying and looking on the front of their annual report, they had daycare highlighted on their annual report. It was actually a very similar photo. So I had to take my husband, had to take two young children, I had to make it work. And maybe just to give you some courage, um, just before we were due to arrive, I was then told that we weren't getting on-site housing, we were getting off-site housing. And I just said, that won't work. It, it just won't work with the way I know my family's structured and I'm not able to come because I'm not going to come and do a bad job. And they reversed that decision and I got the on-site housing. So say what you need. You know, you know the best thing for yourself and your family. So I had the first part of my career in apoptosis, which I'm not going to dwell on because there's not a lot of time, and in breast cancer for 10 years. And I just want to put up... Um, this is a wonderful group of consumers known to me. Um, the K Confab family is a huge part of Australian breast and ovarian cancer research. And these um, women have been a huge part of guiding our research for um, 25 years and consistently, and that's amazing. So this is a little bit touch on my family. So I, I was awarded the inaugural Cory Fellowship, and that gave me extraordinary independence. It was for five years. It meant I had some money, and I really could make my own decisions about what to do. But this is just to reflect on the fact that I couldn't have done any of this. And um, note Nobel laureate Elizabeth Blackburn, um, third from the left. Um, this is both my parents and my in-laws and my brothers and sister and my two sons. And that's because it's a bit like, you know, it takes a village to raise a family, a child. Um, I think it takes an extended family to raise a clinician scientist. So there you go. You've, got, you've just got to have lots of help. So this is another photo board about ovarian cancer consumers because I showed you breast cancer before. And um, again, ovarian cancer Australia and ovarian cancer consumer women and their families and husbands and support um, members are extraordinary in what they can drive. Never forget it because if you need to do things, I'll show you we went on to do rare cancers and rare cancers Australia and Kate and Richard Vines were then pivotal. But never underestimate the power of... Um, of uh, so of that additional voice that can help raise the level of what you want to do to a level that can be heard, not only by our community, but also by government, corporate and pharma and everyone else. So just very quickly, um, how do I run my life? If you haven't read this book, it's a very quick read. A lot of sport analogies in there and airline aviation industry. But I created it into um, an equation so ability we all have. We all have sufficient IQ, and it is possible that too much IQ is not a good thing. Um, energy is super important. That's the 10,000-hour rule. So I made it ability plus energy squared plus opportunity cubed, and I'll just show you why. So certainly thinking outside the box is super important, and it's no point doing the same thing again and again and go to Oppenheimer if you haven't been. Um, that's just an aside. <laughs> um, this is just another 
point that I think is really important. And um, everything you do has to be self-driven. And really, clinician scientists are masochists, and you're going to be totally self-driven if that's what you want to do. Um, and it's self-motivation. And it's um, getting out of bed in the morning. This is the 10,000 hour rule described in the book. It doesn't matter what you do. If you actually calculate it, you will have done 10,000 hours to be really good at it. And if you're going to be at the bench, that counts you know, the same sort of approach. So just think about that. Because when you get out of bed in the morning, and this is the first time I'll mention being a woman, uh, if you've got two young children, you haven't slept properly for four years, you've, it's got to be a privilege to get out of bed in the morning and go to work because otherwise it all becomes you know, quite tedious and it, there is a lot of work to be done, so you really need that drive. And the third part about opportunities, this is actually where I think all the power is, which is why I've got it um, cubed. And this uh, comment, extraordinary advantage, which I think we all have. Just to be in this room, you have extraordinary advantage but conferred by opportunities that you've experienced to date and opportunities into the future. So I would just touch on being in the right place at the right time, stick to your institutions. Very rarely do you need to create new infrastructure. Um, and I had scientific discoveries that I was adjacent to all the way through. And the reason I put my lab photos up here is because the people that you work with end up being the most fundamentally important thing. Your supervisors, your mentors, your colleagues, your peers, and the people you choose to work with long term. And you can make that incredibly positive, but you need to be careful. So just very quickly, a couple of sort of highlights of how we did something a bit differently. So patient drives xenografts are tumours grown in mice and they're directly from patients. And when we started this um, back in 2011, uh, they weren't defined very well and their use wasn't controlled very well. Um, we've since written a textbook on how to do that and contribute to a chapter. But we also, when we um, developed our ovarian cancer focused work, we then defined the use of PDX. So platinum response is something important in patients. We did it in uh, uh, PDX and Monique Top did her undergrad and BBS PhD from Monash on this work. And she's now um, completed oncology training at Peter Mac. So this was the paper that um, was part of her PhD and I'll get to the second one in a moment. Um, but we then worked on sensitivity and resistance to a novel therapeutic called a PARP inhibitor, a DNA repair inhibitor, which has transformed ovarian cancer. And did that by looking not only at reasons for why cancer might respond, but also interrogating new uh, causes of drug resistance and being able to get around them. So this was a new indication for um, PARP inhibitors. And then we did something a little bit different. So Olga Kondrashova is now a group leader at RMIT. She didn't do medical training. Um, what we defined was that if you had these important genes, it could be um, a range of different, but not every tumor suppressor gene. Um, genes can be switched off by mutation, but they can be silenced by methylation. But what we proved was that you had to ha actually have complete silencing, like loss of both copies of a tumour suppressor gene. And if any loss of methylation occurred, the drug would no longer work. And that cleaned up the field, which had been a mess for years. We then did it for another related gene, and Cass Nesic is in my lab still today. She's doing a great job. And then also she's been working with Matt Wakefield on another way of gene regulation, which is splice site alterations. And it's not just um, whether there's a splice site mutation, but whether that drives a different form, a different splice form that in itself uh, could lead to drug resistance. So I just gave you those three examples to show you can work on the same topic, for instance, uh, PARP inhibitors for a long time because there's a lot of detailed work that needs to be done to really understand drug resistance. This is a photo of my very good friend Liz Swisher who's um, Chair of Gynecologic Cancer at the University of Washington in Seattle and we did a lot of our work um, on PARP inhibitors together and still do. So this is then just a quick comment about um, impact and how you can maybe make a difference in terms of providing access for new drugs to people as widely as possible. So our system is the Pharmaceutical Benefits Association and the Medicines Services um, Advisory Committee, sorry, PBA's Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. So you can be involved in um, pushing through access for drugs by uh, giving expert testimony 
to um, PBAC and also MSAC. Sometimes they're coordinated submissions, one for a diagnostic device and one for um, the drug itself. And it's so exciting to me every time I get to write a script for LAPRIB because um, that was something I was privileged um, to be involved in. We've spent a lot of work since then working on these diagnostics for ovarian cancer. And finally, June the 1st, we've now got approval for women who've got first-line ovarian cancer treatment to have access to this $5,000 test and if they have the right sort of ovarian cancer to then access PARP inhibitors. It's not yet on the PBS, but, uh, PBAC, but it will be because there's been a positive recommendation. So going all the way through from the clinic, where I have a lot of clinical trials, get a lot of biopsies from women, grow these PDX, do um, really detailed drug studies in what is pure, pure material can go all the way through to drug um, uh, approvals. So what we tried to do, I've described just for ovarian cancer, I'm not going to describe it for all the other things, but a lot of our consumers were saying, you know, you're doing all this for ovarian cancer, what about all the other rare cancers? Well, there are hundreds, like 500 types of rare cancers. So Angela Watt, who was head of governance at Melbourne at Royal Melbourne Hospital, Melbourne Health. She had been working with me on some uh, agreements that we needed for another rare cancer, mucinous ovarian cancer. We we're doing an international study. And she said, oh my god, we can't do this. We'll both have to retire. So she helped me set up this program. So just it's briefly available for any person with a rare cancer anywhere in Australia. They can consent just with the use of a phone from any state or territory and get up to and including whole genome sequencing. So we did that before COVID when that was a little bit novel. It's not as novel now. But um, what is um, important for a number of stories that I'll just touch on is the degree to which we use um, very detailed analysis of the samples we receive. So then patients can go into many different projects. They're not just confined to one project. We do a lot of whole genome sequencing and we have a lot of maths guys and we I call it hand holding with bioinformaticians. I've always had bioinformaticians. Matt, who I showed you before, is one. And I joint, um, I you know, asked Tony to be joint lead of Stafford Fox with me because I think it's that important and really well done to our maths um, uh, joint convener today. Yeah. <laughs> It's really important. So, you know, we've um, shown, got results to show that whole genome sequencing makes a difference. We've got lots of national and international collaborations, which I don't have time to go into. There's the ARC portal down there, which is where anyone can be referred anywhere around Australia by their cancer specialists. There are tons of people. A third of people who die of cancer in Australia die of a rare cancer, and of those, at least half, if not 20% of all cancer deaths, are due to extraordinarily rare cancers. Mm -hmm. And that's where we then find an expert, either nationally or internationally, and you get to rent a fellow. It's like renting a fellow out to a country doctor. Um, and that has made a difference to the way patients can access care. So just two final thoughts. Where are we going to? So I've talked about ovarian cancer. I've talked about rare cancers. These are all solid tumours. We know that immunotherapy, in fact, if you do surgery and the surgery is great, your immune system will cure you. We're taught that in medical school, right? So what happens if you've already been diagnosed with cancer properly and you want to make sure it goes away? So we've got this trial SOLACE 2, and just to mention again, it's very translationally heavy. It's about to report. We collected tons and tons of samples all the way through COVID. They had to be couriered live all around Australia. Uh, we became incredibly good at accessing buses, trucks, trains, whatever it took when the planes were down. Um, and then this is the final point I want to make. So all the way through, I don't know, for the last 20 years, I've noticed patients who had more than one cancer type. And in my genetics clinics, I would see people who sometimes had three or four. But they all said the same thing to me. None of my doctors coordinate. None of my doctors are interested in my other cancers. And no one has ever spoken to me about having you know, multiple cancers as an issue. And in the end, I worked out that it was because they were well. They, they were cured of each cancer and would go on to get the next cancer. So that red line shows you that if you have three or more cancers, you live to the normal age of the normal population and you live longer, a decade longer, than someone with one or two cancers. So we have a huge program going to understand these are the canaries in the coal mine. What is it about these special people who can have six to seven cancers? And um, we want to turn all the sad people with cancer that's metastatic into happy people where you've prevented their metastases. So we've got a wide range of um, collaborations in this study. And this slide just shows you that our work covers 236 cancer types. It is, it is cancer type agnostic. 
and I hope it will be important in years to come. So I think prevention of metastasis can occur by enhancing the um, immune system properly, and we're trying to do that using these super survivors. But ultimately, I hope these stories have shown you that it's a privilege to be a clinician scientist. You do leap out of bed every morning if you can not do that in the middle of the night and think of something you want to look it up. Um, this is what happened to the two boys. So that's James um, on the far left winning head of the Charles in Boston. He kind of like became a professional role. I didn't even know there was such a thing. But what that basically means is they all go to college in America with all their mates and have a great time. And Will reached the tip of Cape York. He's a reptile breeder doing um, animal ecology at Sunshine Coast University. This um, that acknowledgement slide is massive because you need a massive support system to achieve everything you want to achieve. And often we're just the spokespersons for a whole lot of work that's being done. And there are a lot of collaborators and a lot of consumers there. So thank you for your time and attention. What an amazing snapshot, snapshot of your life. Thank you. I'm sure we could hear from you for about 10 more hours. Now we have some great helpers here who are going to be equipped with microphones and it's your opportunity to ask Claire um, questions about her career, other things she'd do differently, um, etc. She's not here for the spot mentoring so please grab the opportunity. I have a question while you are getting your hands up and that is Claire and I differ in that I'm a clinical scientist mm -hmm. and Claire, Claire actually does the harder job, I think. She combines basic science with a very a huge clinical load. Tell us what's good and bad about that. I think every, for example, scientist I know who works in the lab with human tissue knows the value of working out exactly which patients you need to study. And you can access biobanks and uh, other collections internationally or nationally to get exactly what you need. But there's nothing like collecting it yourself because then you know the outcome of the patient, you know the outcome of the tissue and the derivatives that you generate from that tissue so that you can then ask many different questions. So I think it's being so close to the source of tissue that you need to study and ultimately to make novel discoveries, you need to have that connection with patient outcome. Cell lines, if you look at those, for example, in 2D, they've been, you know, many have been around for a really long time and, and no longer reflect the patient. An important study was published for ovarian cancer about um, eight years ago now that showed that really only about four of the ovarian cancer cell lines that we use frequently actually reflected the type of ovarian cancer that they were meant to. And that's because they'd undergone change. Um, in culture over time. And so that led to a complete um, change in the way we reviewed papers because we were able to quote that study and say, OK, this is really nice, but how does it relate to women? So I think it's that close connectivity with the patient base. And ultimately, also, we have um, whole uh, streams of clinical trials where you'll have one trial where you're planning the next one in that pipeline, um, either adding drugs or changing drugs or changing the questions you're asking, changing the types of patient inclusion criterion. So I think that, again, um, being super close to all that is really helpful. Yeah, look, I mean, I think your last comment about the multiple survivors of multiple can cancers would only have been seen by a clinician seeing the patients going, this is extraordinary, these are special, how can I change the world by understanding that? What I, what I, my question was really around how do you manage the lab science as well? How do you stay at the top level of that as well as combine that with a clinical career? I, I couldn't see myself being able to do that. Um, so I, I did make the point that I had done a lot of lab work myself. So for those 10 years and even for yeah, probably up until 2010, I was still doing what I call mouse rounds. Did you see the mice? Did anyone walk past the mice? Um, it's coffee, but I, I thought it was mice anyway. It's Melbourne something rather coffee it's society. Coffee. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, um, yeah, look, I did a huge amount of lab work, but then I... Um, I didn't talk about funding, so I take a tripartite approach to funding, which is the core NHMRC, MRFF type funding, and I have an investigator grant. Then um, philanthropy, uh, so 
philanthropic funding is huge. It allows you to have um, independence. Those other grants only pay for about 70% of what you need anyway. They don't pay to how, how you got those samples that you want to work on. So you need philanthropy to cover a huge amount of what I showed you. And then there's pharma funding. So we now do a lot of pharma work and you charge at least double the budget. So you can cover a lot of um, uh, salaries if you also use pharma funding. So the long way of getting back to your question is that I have really superb senior people in my team and I always say, uh, if you look at Jeff Linderman, he's got Jane Visvader. Um, you cannot run a lab, I don't think, these days as a sole clinician scientist because the amount of technology is so huge. So I have three group leaders in my lab and I also have another postdoc who specialises in toys. So that means she just loves the newest imaging technology, the, the newest way of doing things, and they are much more able to stay abreast of those discoveries than I can. Yeah. Great. So you can't do everything in the lab yourself? Not at all. No, you need a team to do that. And I just, if there are some questions, that would be great. Um, the other thing to mention is I don't think everywhere gets quite the philanthropy that cancer does yeah, and right. that the WEHI does. WEHI is famous and gets a lot of philanthropy. There's a question over here. Oh, I've got one there too. Good. Um, and so I, I don't think you can count on philanthropy. I work in severe mm. childhood epilepsies mm. and it ain't sexy, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah. And we do not get a lot of funding and I'm not based at the Royal Children's Hospital, so that ain't sexy mm. either. Yeah. And so philanthropy, you know, when you have cancer or you have a heart attack, the patient's sure they're dying and they give a lot of money. Very different world mm. when you're uh, in the world of epilepsy. I wish it was a bit more uh, equal, but uh, mm. uh, I think it's wonderful. I'm not knocking it. I'm just envious, as you can hear. Mm. Now, there's a question over there. Hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Belinda. I'm a um, PhD student coming up to my confirmation meeting now. Fantastic. And I was um, curious about... Um, you know, going from finishing a PhD and deciding on, a, you know, continuing on the research career, yeah. how did you know um, you wanted to do that? And what does that look like for clinician scientists? Because I feel like for, um, you know, our scientific scientists, there's a very clear, clearly defined path. And I, I don't know what that looks like for, for us. Thank you. I guess, uh, thank you for the question and congratulations on nearly completing your PhD. That's fantastic. It will stand you in great stead for the rest of your life. That's the biggest message I could give to this audience, I think. Um, depends a little bit what type of researcher you think you want to be. If you want to be a lab-based researcher, then you should apply for uh, postdoctoral fellowships. I mean, I believe that you need to have, you know, pure science for X number of years. It depends on your field, how long you want to do that for. Um, and that perhaps is the traditional uh, trajectory, I guess. Um, there are other opportunities depending where you want to be based, where you might be able to get um, uh, an appointment that allows you to do part-time research and say three days a week clinical. It really depends on your area. So you need to speak to your mentors. You should have multiple mentors because you need different types of mentors to cover the different parts of your life. Um, so I don't want to necessarily comment for you. I can really only comment for myself and say I'd go hardcore and do proper postdocs and then you will be able to train properly for another series of years. And while doing that, you still um, will hopefully be able to do a clinic a week as a doctor. Um, this is assuming you've finished your specialty. Um, if it's an area where it's really tough to get funding, um, then you just need to keep seeking out supervisors who have access to soft money for first year, uh, you know, uh, some money for that first year while you get more runs on the board to be competitive for a postdoctoral fellowship. And that's because it takes a while for the papers to come from your PhD. And an example would be that RACP offers a series of um, fellowships, like I, I held the Dunlop, no, the Arnott Fellowship. So the Arnott Fellowship's quite um, flexible. So I think that it's really important to reach out and ask mentors, ask your supervisors, ask the, RS, ask the college, or whichever is your college, to see um, where those funding opportunities lie. Great. Now there was a question there. Thank you. 
Actually, it'd be good if you say your name and where you're from, just so we get a feeling. Oh, hi, my name is Rose, I'm from Manhattan University. I just had a question uh, about the, what your thoughts on the importance of uh, higher degrees for a research career. So I think there are some consultants where they just do their specialty training uh, and don't do a PhD for master's my research and they just uh, do research side by side with the clinical work. Uh, what's your opinion on how important it is to do a higher degree like PhD or master's by research in becoming a clinician scientist? Thank you for your question. I, I guess I'm biased. I think that doing a PhD is is another one of life's luxuries. It's really tough in the first 18 months, but then you're the expert. Whatever you're working on, you now know more than your supervisors, and you're really cool. And so then you've got another year and a half, or an extra year if you go to four years, as many people do, to produce as much as you can in the way of productivity out of that PhD. And it, it, that, that style of thinking never leaves you. You'll never have another time in your life where you have the privilege and the luxury of focusing on one question for four years. I mean, you will, like I've shown you, that I've continued to work on a series of questions, but that's not the same as in a PhD where you don't have as many other responsibilities. So people regard a PhD as having allowed someone to learn how to think and to think in a critical way and to put their ideas together, and they've managed to follow through you know, and write the thesis and write the papers. So it's a two-edged benefit. One is it actually does teach you those things and allow you to accumulate those habits, but it presents to the world that you were able to do that. And I don't know any area where a PhD would not be helpful as a clinician scientist. You can do a master's, which is two years. Master's degrees um, would be relevant for certain types of clinical research. So again, I think that that would go back to your supervisors to, um, to speak about, and sometimes that can be done via papers. You can actually do a PhD via papers as well, but that's pretty tough. So if for some reason you don't want to do a PhD or it's not appropriate to your area, a master's is absolutely fine as well. Did Great. that answer? Question just here. Any other? And where's the other microphone person? There's a, oh, a question over here too. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Addy and I'm from DK. Yeah. Uh, so, like, for me, I do hope to have a family one day. So I was wondering if you had any advice or tips for, um, because I know, like, uh, you know, when you're balancing a career and a family, you probably made a tough decision. So I was wondering whether you had any advice or tips. It's a really hard question. Um, you know, I'm sure my kids now wish that I hadn't worked as hard. My husband worked from home, so that meant that uh, it was much easier for me. And all the way through, I did things like tried to develop support structure for, you know, women at WeHi and things like that. And we have a gender equity committee that's really uh, broad across about 15 different ways of trying to help. Um, and obviously, those things are there for men and women. So I think the increased flexibility that we have in our lifestyle now is much better. And everyone in my lab knows that they can come and go whenever they need to, just get their work done. So I'll often get sent stuff on a weekend or overnight by someone who had to take you know, time off during the day. So flexibility is absolutely important. But what you're saying is, are you really willing to sacrifice your time with your children and your children's time in order to do the ridiculous number of hours work that we have to do? Now, this is meant to be a plus, you know, positive session, but only you can know in discussion with your partner and perhaps also with your children and how they are, not discussing with it, but knowing. You know, obviously, I only had two boys and I was lucky they were both fine. If any of those things had been different or if we'd realised then we wished we'd had more children, I might not have been able to do what I did. So I think you have to really have frank discussion with your family and your extended family. That extended family slide I showed, I did on purpose because my in-laws you know, were absolutely pivotal as well. So you've just got to really look at your construct. But that word driven that a lot of us use, you know, ultimately if you are driven to do this because you have an inquiring mind and curiosity is at the beginning and end of everything you do, um, you'll work it out. 
but definitely get that village around you. And um, I, I'll give one other story. So I was Susan Corey's postdoc, right? And we were having a small meeting in her office and she wouldn't mind me saying this, I'm sure. My phone rang and I just stood up, walked out and took the call. And I came back and she kind of looked at me a bit oddly as if, my God, you dare to leave my lab meeting. And I just said, it doesn't matter if that was a sick mouse, a sick child or a sick patient. If I deal with it now, it won't blow up. And she never asked again. And so again, what I'm saying is times were changing, right? This was me coming back. I, there hadn't been a female clinician scientist at that sort of time in that position, certainly not in Suzanne's lab. And so she wasn't accustomed to me flitting off as we do, you know, for patients and whatever. And so that was a bit of a new um, take on things. But I think you'll all benefit from a much more flexible workforce and also one that recognises your right to be a parent. <laughs> it did so more for me. I mean, she brought her kids in there in the bassinet under the bench. So it's worth looking at the changes. But I worked really long hours. And I don't think, I don't see my guys doing the same thing. We give them a lot more leeway because we recognise it's essential. So I, ho I hope that gives you some tips. I think that's very useful. I mean, Suzanne is not a clinician. No, so you were really right. changing her yep. worldview, which was very important. And she had male clinician scientists in her lab yeah. at that time, like Jeff. She'd had Jeff. So, but not women who were doing everything all at once. Last question over here. Yes. Hello. Uh, oh, that's hard. Uh, so I'm Paul. I'm a first year medical student at um, the University of Melbourne. And I appreciate the, the, um, the slide that's creating itself as it goes. It's uh, pretty cool. As well. um, so I just had a question around like your motivation and your drive, the yeah. idea that you know <clears throat> you have such a busy life and so you need to find something that drives you and motivates you to get up every day. Uh, I really resonated with that personally. Uh, but I was just wondering, given all the different aspects of your life that make you so busy and, mm -hmm. and you mentioned you were living off very little sleep for a number of years, yeah. I was wondering if there were certain days where you felt less willing, less able to sort of plow on with the day knowing what was ahead. And I was wondering if, if that was the case, if there are any strategies you sort of had to cope yeah. with that, yeah. other than coffee, of course. I think that um, one thing uh, that Ingrid said, which was bad things go wrong all the time, and that's normal. So you see, we don't get hysterical if three things have gone wrong in a row. Because you're waiting for things, the things that go right are amazing. So I have another saying, which is, if one really good thing has happened today, you don't get to complain about anything. And also, you let that feeling, recognise that feeling, and make sure you feel really safe and happy for that entire day. There'll be other days where you've got to do really hard stuff, right? And you've sorted your day out from the night before or whatever, you know, everything happening. Sometimes you think, oh, God, I don't know how I'm going to get home tonight <laughs> because I've just got so many ridiculous things that happen to fall on the same day. And you do get home. Um, and so then I think it's really important to recognise which weekends you're actually going to take for yourself. You don't get every weekend for yourself. Or even um, you might have times that work out in your family's life on the weekend when you know you can do a bit of work and it's not going to upset anyone. So you can just slot tasks in there. But those other times you really have to revel in the fact that you have time off and time with your family, and time to be peaceful. And if you've had a really bad run, you have to say, I'm going to sleep properly till six or seven every morning for the next month. And maybe you can't do it every morning, but most mornings. So self-care is incredibly important, and resilience is important. And we weren't taught about resilience. There are very good books out there about resilience, and a little bit like Malcolm Gladwell, you know, find a good resilience book and read it, because these are strategies that have been well worked out by lots of other super smart people. And I think um, because your life's going to be you and what you choose to do. And I don't think you have to find something to drive you, an idea to drive you. That should come as a result of you working through. So each point when you make a decision about what to do next, you're sort of following what's going to get me out of bed in the morning. And then that big idea will come to you gradually over that sort of five to ten year period. Well, please join me in thanking Claire. <laughs> that was an incredibly inspiring story, and I think you've heard about so many elements 
uh, that Claire juggles in order to be a, a really a preeminent clinician scientist. And we're really grateful that you've come and shared that and the many aspects of your life with us. So I think it's important to start to drill down on that.